moderating is Dov Zakheim, former Under Secretary of Defense, live coverage on C-SPAN 3. The of the Middle East has become increasingly complex over the past few years to the point where I think many of our friends in the region have no idea where we are on just about any issue. Uh, to give you an example from Saudi Arabia, if you're sitting in Riyadh, on the one hand, you, want, you see that the United States is prepared to sell you literally $20 billion worth of arms. On the other hand, you see that members of the Senate, on a bipartisan basis, are concerned about the more recent sales, and these two gentlemen are prepared to talk about that because they're sponsoring legislation to that effect. On the one hand, the United States is supporting the operations that Saudi Arabia is conducting against the Houthis, who are sponsored by Iran. On the other hand, the United States tells Saudi Arabia to share the Gulf with Iran. So if you're in Riyadh, how do you figure that out? And the same sorts of — and, oh, by the way, there's then Syria, where for such a long time the United States said Mr. Assad should go, which was where Saudi Arabia was, and now it seems to be saying Mr. Assad can stick around for a while, which Saudi Arabia kind of gets puzzled about. And that's just one country. If you look at Israel, if you look at Egypt, if you look at the other countries in the Gulf, you see the same degree of confusion, this one huge question mark. So to help enlighten us, uh, we have our two senators, and I believe Senator Paul is going to speak first and give us his views, and then Senator Murphy and we're a bipartisan center, and actually works out nicely. To my right is the Republican, and to my left is the Democrat. <laughs> so, Senator Paul, over to you. Well, thank you, and thank you to the Centers for National Interest for having us and for this discussion. And I think there are a lot of aspects of foreign policy where right and left can come together and where party doesn't make so much difference. Uh, there's been a bipartisan consensus on foreign policy in this town for a long time. Unfortunately, I think the bipartisan consensus may now be wrong, and there needs to be another bipartisan consensus talking in, in another fashion. But I'm excited that this week Senator Murphy and I and uh, Senator Franken and Senator Lee will introduce legislation, and it's a privileged resolution. And this is uh, very unusual in the Senate in the, in the sense that it will be voted on. It has to be voted on within a period of time. So the plan now is it will be introduced on Wednesday and it will be voted on Wednesday. This almost never happens. So a privileged resolution is extraordinary uh, in Congress. The power to do this was given to us by the Arms Export Control Act of 1976. But this resolution will say to the President that we disapprove of the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. Now, your next question might be, what will he do? He could veto it. The House could sit on it. There are a lot of things that may happen. But I think it elevates the debate, and it allows Congress to be part of this decision. Now, some might ask, why would Congress have anything to do with foreign policy? Isn't foreign policy the bailiwick of the chief magistrate, of the President? Well. According to our Founding Fathers, it was intended to be our bailiwick. The initiation of war was specifically taken away from the presidency and given to Congress. And if you look at Madison's words discussing this, Madison said that the branch most prone to war is the executive branch. Therefore, with studied care, the Constitution took that power and vested it in the legislature. But we've gotten away from that. You might also ask, how can arms sale be anything to do with initiation of war? It's just sale of arms to an ally. In this case, there is a war going on in Yemen. We are refueling the planes that are dropping the bombs. We are giving the targets, and we have people positioned there helping to guide the missiles into their targets. So I think we are actively part of a war in Yemen, and I think almost no American knows that we're involved with it. That initiation of war, we can debate the pros and cons of whether we should do it. We can debate whether it's in our vital national interest, but we can't just simply have no debate. So I think it's absolutely important, and I think it's a big deal that we are bringing this forward. This and other issues have brought Senator Murphy and I together, also the discussion of whether or not, when we go to war, that Congress should authorize it. So the authorization of use of military force, there were two in the last 15 years, one to go after the people who attacked us on 9-11, and that's simply what it said, and then the other for the Iraq war. Neither of those apply to Yemen. Neither of those, frankly, apply to Syria. They need to be debated. 
So about two years ago in the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, they were discussing a water bill and I insisted on an amendment to authorize force, the use of force in the Middle East and to debate that. And we had a pretty good debate without, an, without a conclusion, but we began the debate. Unfortunately, it didn't go to Congress. Congress points their fingers. Republicans say Democrats should do it. Democrats say Republicans should do it. And it languishes and yet we are at war without a debate. When you talk to our soldiers who fight in the wars, Every one of them that I, I, I encounter, lots in Fort Campbell, lots in Fort Knox, saw kids the other day from the Naval Academy. Every one of them says they, they want the people to have debated this. In fact, there is an American soldier right now in court suing over whether or not it's a constitutional war, a valid order for him to go to war since Congress has not authorized the war. I don't think these are arcane points. I don't think they're moot points. I think it's incredibly important that Congress be part of foreign policy. It's what our founding fathers intended. And I think this debate this week over whether or not we send arms into Saudi Arabia is a, an important and valid one. I'm, I'm uh, very excited to have Senator Murphy uh, being a, a partner in this. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Senator Murphy. Okay. There you go. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you to. Uh, to the Center for the National Interest for inviting us here. This is my first trip, and so I hope it's uh, the first of many. Um, uh, let me just associate myself with uh, every single one of the sentiments of Senator Paul. I, I think we are, as a Congress, at, at risk of putting ourselves out of the business of helping to set and conduct the foreign policy of this nation. Uh, it's really easy to declare war when it's a well-defined enemy. Uh, when you are fairly certain at the end of hostilities there's going to be a neatly wrapped up peace treaty. It's much more difficult to declare war when the enemy is shadowy and diffuse, when victory is harder to define. But the responsibility to declare war isn't conditional upon how difficult the parameters of that declaration are. Uh, and by Congress's refusal to authorize the war against ISIS, through its refusal to authorize the current operations that are happening inside Yemen, we are at risk of never, ever again being relevant, at least in our lifetimes, uh, on matters of war making and foreign policy. And so I think this is serious and it's precedential. But, uh, but Rand did a great job of making this case. So let me just drill down onto the particulars of why we care about this arms sale. Uh, this uh, arms sale is in part designed to replace weaponry that has been battle damaged in uh, the Saudi and the Saudi-led coalition fight against the Houthis inside and around Yemen. And the question is whether it's in the U.S. national security interest to continue to largely unconditionally back the Saudis' play in this civil war. Now, the first thing to say is that this is not a proxy war inside Yemen. There is no doubt that the Iranians have taken advantage of the Houthis' march on Sana'a and made the decision to supply them and assist them. But the Iranians do not have a command and control relationship over the Houthis. And so to view this simply as a clean, clear fight between the Saudis and the Iranians misunderstands the nature of this conflict. Second, if you talk to Yemenis on the ground, they will tell you that this is a U.S. bombing campaign or a U.S.-Saudi bombing campaign. They view every civilian casualty as having an American imprint to it. And so we have to take seriously the fact that we own, in some way, shape, or form, every single civilian death. And as much as we have been pressing the Saudis to get better, they are not. In a 72-hour period earlier this summer, they bombed another Doctors Without Borders facility, a school, and the principal's house next door. And even when we tell them not to bomb targets, like a key bridge used for the supply and resupply of humanitarian relief, they ignore us and still bomb those civilian facilities. So we bear responsibility for the way and the method in which this war is being conducted. But second, even if you believe that there is an important message to being sent to the Iranians, through U.S. participation in this fight. We all have to ask ourselves, what is our chief and primary goal in the Middle East? Is it to send messages to Iran, or is it to defeat extremism? 
because the fact of the matter is that this civil war has allowed for both al-Qaeda and ISIS to gain footprints and footholds inside Yemen that they never had before. AQAP is the most likely branch of al-Qaeda to strike the United States again. Their recruitment has spiked because of the space that they have gained through the civil war in Yemen. For a period of time, they had control of a major port city by which they were earning more money than they ever had before in the history of that organization. And so from a U.S. national security perspective, if we are helping to radicalize Yemenis against us, we are participating in the slaughter of, civil of civilians, and we are allowing extremist groups who have plans and plots against the United States to go stronger, how can that be in our security interest? And so I think this is a question of Congress's relevance on matters of foreign policy, but I also think this is a very direct and immediate question as to whether we're going to continue to fund and supply a war that is hurting our national security rather than advancing it. Now, stopping one arms sale uh, does not put an end to the administration's participation in these hostilities, but a uh, positive vote or a very strong vote would send a bipartisan signal that things have to change, and that's why I'm very proud to be working with Senator Paul on this resolution. Well, thanks very much, and, and thank you both for making the case so clearly and allowing a lot of time for the many people who are here to ask questions. Uh, I'll take the uh, prerogative of the chair to start. And when, by the way, when you all uh, have a comment or a question, uh, apart from, of course, trying to keep it short, um, please identify yourself. I'll do the same. I'm Dov Zakheim. I'm vice chairman of the center. Uh, a question for, for both of you. Um, clearly, you've made a very strong case. There are many merits to the case. but. As a result, would Congress be sending even more mixed signals to the Saudis than they're already getting? And would that actually make things worse, not better? And as a co corollary to that, would that drive them into the hands of the one man who is more and more influential in the Middle East, namely Mr. Putin, who seizes on every opportunity to, to push us out and push himself in? What are your reactions to that? You know, I think it's, it, it should not primarily be our goal, what message we're sending. Our first goal in the first part of the debate is, is it in our vital national security interest to be involved? I view uh, the weapons that we manufacture as not being completely private. They're not like the, the items that you see stocked in Walmart. The U.S. taxpayer has paid for the defense, the weapons that we have in our Defense Department, and I think the taxpayer re retains an interest and, and, in a vague way, ownership in that, and that's why the Congress has specifically said that we can veto arms sales. Now, we've sold $100 billion, and I, was, I, I saw the figure in an article a couple weeks ago, and I, I almost didn't believe it. We've sold $100 billion to Saudi Arabia in uh, the last eight years. And so I think that this is, um, I don't know that there's going to be a mixed signal, but I don't think they have a shortage of weaponry in uh, what they've gotten from us. But I think it seems to be so shorthand. Whenever you read anything in foreign policy, people say, we need to do things that are in our national security interest. Well, yeah, sure. But that's a debate. And the only way we debate that is by talking about the issues, and then it gets to the specifics that Senator Murphy was referring to. We have to debate whether it is in our interest. But we also have to debate intended versus unintended. And I think the complexity of the Middle East is such that we are often getting the unintended. And I don't really question the motives of most of the people in Congress or the President. I think they want what's best, but we often are getting the unintended consequences. One of the unintended consequences of the Syrian war is millions of people displaced. I think the same can happen in Yemen. Um, I think Saudi Arabia, frankly, should be taking refugees from, from Syria as well as Yemen. And uh, I like the way I think it was Thomas Friedman described them as both arsonist and firefighters. Uh, you know, they're throwing fuel on the flames in one sense, but in another sense, they're also uh, attempting to help. So it may send a mixed message, but they're sending a mixed message to us as to their loyalties by spreading Wahhabism throughout the world people hatred of America, even in our country, they have supported schools of, that preach hatred of our country, uh, that needs to end. And you know, there was an article by the former um, uh, Ambassador Z Zaliad? Zaliad? Zaliad. Yes. Zaliad. 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 Zaliad.
Yes. <laughs> uh, recently, that one, that recently <laughs> talking about Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, sort of mea culpa, we're going to do better. But I think uh, holding back the arms may give them a chance maybe to show that they can do better. I would just I would just restate this important point that Senator Paul made about the dramatic increase in arms sales to Saudi Arabia and during this administration. We're talking about a six to eight fold increase in the uh, dollar amount of arms sold to Saudi Arabia in the Obama administration versus the Bush administration. We could we should recognize as a baseline fact that we are selling more and giving them more than ever before. And so to argue that there should be some scaling back or some pause on arms scale is at some level just a recognition that the pace here is very different than ever before. And I would absolutely argue that we should be sending signals to the Saudis that our support for them is conditional. Uh, if, if consistency is your ultimate goal here, then I guess we should answer the call anytime the Saudis ask. But if your goal is to create a more functional relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia, then occasionally you have to say no. And the fact of the matter is, is that they have asked for our help in fighting the Houthis. It is not international interest to answer that call. And so it makes sense for us to tell them that we're not going to be with them this time. There are going to be plenty of other moments where we will be with the Saudis. This is an instance in which it may be in their interest to fight this war inside Yemen. It is not in our interest. And, and I would concur with what Senator Paul said. I think you've got to take a, I think it's time to take stock of this relationship. Uh, every year, Saudi representatives come here and tell us that they um, uh, that either they've made mistakes in terms of funding the wrong people abroad or the story real is, really isn't like the newspapers tell it. The fact of the matter is, is that there is a directly proportional relationship to the amount of Saudi and Wahhabi money that goes into parts of the globe and the success of terrorist recruiters in finding people that will follow them into the fight in place like, places like Afghanistan and Syria. Take a look at the Balkans as example number one. There is a direct relationship between the focus of of, uh, of Gulf state actors uh, on creating a bedrock of conservative Salafist teaching in the Balkans and the ability of those recruiters to recruit out of those areas. And they continually tell us that they're going to get better. They continually tell us that they're focusing more on being the firefighters than the arsonists. For the last year and a half, they've told us that they're going to get better on their targeting. They don't. And so I would argue it's time for our relationship to be a little bit less consistent and a little bit more conditional. Okay, I'm throwing it open. Uh, John, the ambassador, and we'll take those two on that side. Yes, uh, John Duke Anthony, President, National Council on U.S. Air Relations. Um, I agree with much of what both of you have said in terms of that which is reprehensible about some of what makes us wince. However, we're charged with being um, lacking in empathy. Uh, we have a deficit on that front. And so the question is, how would you try to show an empathetic view and analysis perspective assessment from Riyadh's perspective. Uh, we're with you on America's perspective, most of us, or certainly many of us, and I am. Uh, but what's missing here is uh, a partner's uh, views. Does it not have legitimate needs, legitimate interests, legitimate concerns, legitimate goals that pretty much parallel ours, not all, they're hardly bereft of blemish, devoid of default. But when we refer to them sometimes uh, implicitly as free riders, they could turn it around and say that, uh, no, we're, we're the free riders. They have $750 billion in our financial system. We don't have a penny in theirs. Um. I think there are many places in which our interests uh, align, and, and and this may be you know part of where uh, Senator Paul and I may um, may differ. But uh, you know, any time that I talk about my desire to try to recast this relationship, I admit that there are plenty of very positive things that the Saudis do in the region. Our partnership on counterintelligence is critical. Their ability to, um, to, to, to facilitate the ongoing detente between GCC, Sunni nations, and Israel, very important to, um, to U.S. national security goals. Um, but I would argue that we are no longer 
um, that our interests are not aligned in fundamental ways in the, in, in, in the way that uh, many new senators and congressmen are taught when you show up here. I think we have largely turned the other way and allowed for the Saudis to create um, a version of Islam which has become the building blocks for the very groups that we are fighting today. And we have pled with them, we have asked them to stop, and the evidence suggests that they have, that they have not. Over the course of the last year and a half, we have begged them to be better about targeting. We have told them the targets not to hit, and they have not listened. And so I do think it's time to question whether this alliance is as clear and as, uh, and as solid as many of us uh, may have been told it was, as essential as it may be today, um, as, it may, as it once was. Um, I think the Saudis need to show us uh, something in return, and I don't see a lot of evidence over the last five years uh, for that to, to be the case. There are plenty of other places which we will continue to coordinate. There may be other calls for assistance that we can answer. When it comes to the civil war in Yemen, I, I have yet to see a reason why it's in our national security interest. You know, I would say that uh, we don't al only show empathy through arms. I mean, I think we can show empathy through trade. I'm not proposing we cut off trade with Saudi Arabia. I would also propose that the more interconnected our economies are, the better. Uh, the fact that China owes, owns uh, quite a bit of our debt, that Saudi Arabia owns quite a bit of our debt. Um, I wish we didn't have so much debt, but the fact that we're intertwined is actually a good thing. The more you trade, the less you're likely to fight. So I think that's good. But I don't think it has to be that, oh, we – with because this is, this is always used with regard to uh, aid as well. If we don't give aid, if we don't give more aid, we don't like them enough. Well, maybe it should be about trade as well. But also Saudi Arabia could be more open to allowing investment and American or other outsider ownership of companies within their, within their country. We allow it in our country. They could immediately start changing in their schools, and instead of hearing hatred of America and hatred of the West, we could hear their schools teaching uh, tolerance. And there have been some good news. I mean, people have talked about, it, uh, you know, uh, a reformation within Islam, that there are many people within Islam saying things that we're just not hearing because we're so preoccupied with – and necessarily so – with bombs, you know, but that we're not hearing the, uh, the other side of more tolerant Islam that is tolerant of other religions. And, you know, I meet many professional Muslims in my workings as a physician and also in this country who are very tolerant individuals, and we live and interact in, in, a, in, a, in a coordinated way in our country. But Saudi Arabia isn't uh, – doesn't seem to be exemplifying that, and I think they could do a better job, frankly. But I don't think it means we always have to uh, ha be selling them arms. I think that there can be some limitations. And, in fact, I think there can be some better behavior by withholding it rather than continuing the open, open uh, arms sales. Ted. Uh, Ted Kutu, former uh, U.S. ambassador to the Emirates in Syria. Uh, it's the popular perception, at least in this town, was that the Obama administration agreed to help Saudi Arabia and Yemen largely to placate them over the Iran nuclear deal and to ensure that they didn't create more waves than were already being created by Prime Minister Netanyahu and others. Uh, also, in, um, in reference to the point that uh, Dov Zakheim raised, that, uh, you know, the Saudis might uh, – Putin might find a way to play with the uh, Saudi-Iranian issue, it would seem to me, at least, that that the Russians and Saudis have a long history of distrust of one another. And to this day, I think the Russians believe that a lot of the problems of Chechnya uh, were a result of U.S. and Saudi uh, influence uh, there. So do you see that with Putin moving close to Iran at this point, that there really is chance for mischief with Saudi Arabia? I, I'm, I'm not as worried about this idea that the Saudis are going to run to the arms of the Russians, especially given some of the clear signals that the Russians have shown of interest in coordinating with, uh, with Iran with respect to other conflicts in the region. Um, and I, I do perceive um, our initial moves to partner with Saudi Arabia 
uh, on the conflict in Yemen uh, as part of a broader strategy surrounding the Iran deal. And no one in the administration has said that to me, but I think you can – it stands to reason that the two are, uh, are, 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 are interlinked. Frankly, my preference – my preference would be for Congress to make um, uh, our support for this arms sale conditional. And the initial legislation that Senator Paul and I proposed would have allowed for this arms sale to go forward uh, should there be tangible progress uh, on these issues of the targeting of civilians and clear evidence that the Saudis and the coalition were going after al-Qaeda and ISIS targets, uh, not just Houthi targets. And as you know, the Emiratis have done very good work in going after um, AQAP, but they have done that without assistance from the Saudis by, by and large. Uh, and so I, I understand why the administration decided to support them in this, uh, in this fight. But given the fact that they have shown no willingness to listen to our concerns, um, I think now is the time for us to withdraw that support. Uh, had the Saudis conducted this operation in a different manner, had they used U.S. refueling capacity to run as many missions against AQAP in Mukalla as they are against the Houthis in and around Sana'a, then we'd probably be having a different discussion to, uh, today. Um, uh, but that has not been how it's played out. You know, we began the discussion with some of the questions of what are the unintended consequences. I think one of the unintended consequences of pushing Assad back was creating a space in which ISIS grew. I don't think anybody really, you know, when people talk about who created what, they created themselves. Nobody wants ISIS other than themselves to be successful. However, I do think it's an unintended consequence of pushing Assad back. What will be the unintended consequence of bombing the Houthis? If the Saudis defeat the Houthis, who takes over? The Saudi-led coalition or AQAP, the Al-Qaeda in the peninsula, or uh, ISIS? Frankly, ISIS has a toehold there as well. So um, I think we do have to be very concerned with that. Um, and did was this is this done? You know, the arms sale to Saudi Arabia done it to placate them over Iran appearing to get money? Yes, and I think more more than just placating, it is a is essentially uh, fueling an arms race because Iran, um, whether we like it or not, it will take some of this money that's been released to them. And you can arguably say it was theirs, but they're going to take that money and buy conventional weapons with it. And Saudi Arabia then will buy conventional weapons to counteract that. Um, one of the great ironies of the Middle East right now is looking at all of the weapons there, all of the U.S. weapons. Uh, there's a certain degree of irony to seeing U.S. tanks rolling in from Turkey and fighting against U.S. arms in the hands of the Kurds. There's some irony to going to the little town above Aleppo, I think you say it, Murray or Morea, and seeing Pentagon-backed Kurds fighting CIA-backed Syrian moderates in pitted battles with two, two different branches of our government supporting each side of a battle. Um, it's a messy place, and we really need to step back and be wise about our decisions. It doesn't mean do nothing, but I think we, we have often done too much. Of course, the example you just gave was proof that we do have a whole of government. It's just we support everybody. <laughs> you had a question back there. Uh, Antoine Issa from the Middle East Institute. Um, I just wanted to spin this question of arms sales um, from a more broader perspective um, in terms of uh, it's the broader Obama's strategy of trying to not disengage but engage less in the Middle East militarily and enabling its regional allies um, in, in the Middle East to be capable enough militarily to take um, ownership of the region and uh, whether that means uh, you know, engaging in security matters on their own without depending so much on U.S. military to do it for them and do their bidding. So in that context, um, do you see the call for scrapping or cancelling arms sales? Um, it's just another one of those mixed messages of, hey, take ownership of the region, but we're not going to give you any weapons to do it. Uh, I, I, I would just say that... that, that in this case, the Saudis are not taking ownership of this in that they cannot conduct this operation without major U.S. tactical uh, and strategic support. Uh, and I, I don't know what the answer to this question is, but if the United States had decided not to supply the refueling capacity, had decided to not sell them replacements for the munitions uh, that they had dropped, did not replace the battle 
damaged tanks, were, were not on the ground inside Yemen, were not providing the intelligence, um, would they be participating at the same level that they are inside Yemen? Now, the answer may be yes, and the administration will tell you that the answer is yes, and that more people would be dead today, because the targeting would be even worse than it is uh, with our help. But, but I think that's an outstanding question. And so I don't — I understand what the, the administration is doing, which is, pu which is pulling back and trying to facilitate some ability for Sunni states to take care of Sunni problems. Um, but that's not this. We are still — clearly and intimately involved in this question um, in, in this civil war, and, and I agree with, uh, with Rand. Um, I, I think it's deeply problematic that we have not weighed in on this question, because this certainly looks like uh, acts of war by the United States against the Houthi people. I mean, it, it does. You know, I think it goes back to is the only way we have engagement through arms, aren't there other ways we engage? So, for example, I actually do want more engagement, but I also want to see more diplomatic engagement. I think the most important uh, aspect of peace in Syria is engagement with Russia. So when I was active in the presidential debates, you may remember when everybody else was saying they wanted to punch Russia in the nose and they wanted a no-fly zone and they were ready to shoot down Russian jets, I was saying, well, you know, I think Russia could be part of the solution. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that Russia is always good or that uh, they're always going to do the right thing, but they have had a base in Syria for, what, 50 years. I don't see them leaving. I see them pretty active in the region, and I think if we engage them, that if there is a solution, it probably does involve Russia. And it falls in a negotiation with Russia, and I think that uh, – the second most important negotiation over there is between Turks and Kurds. Um, I always tell people when, as I go around the country and talk is that ISIS is like 20, 25,000 people. That's how many fighters they have. The Turks have 600,000 in their army. The Peshmerga have 200,000. The Iraqi army has 200,000. Jordanians, I think, have several hundred thousand. The Israelis have a million. They're surrounded by two million people who don't like them. It sounds like the, what we need to do is have a diplomatic arrangement where we all aren't shooting each other and they're all training their fire on, on, the, on the enemy of civilization, the enemy of peace. Um, but there are longstanding problems between the Turks and the Kurds. So I, every time I say that it should be really easy, why don't the Kurds in Turkey move across the border to the new Kurdish area and, and forget about claims in Turkey? But uh, I haven't had a lot of people say that that will be easily done. But there needs to be some kind of truce between the Turks and the Kurds. And that is being more engaged, not less engaged. Uh, so I do think diplomacy is incredibly important. And I think that's where people mistake the whole concept of what a foreign policy is, that if you don't always believe that arms are answer and you don't always believe that war is the answer, it doesn't mean that we're shirking the region and we're going to do nothing. Uh, so I think trade and diplomacy are important things. And I think they go both ways. The more we are intertwined with the Middle East, not just buying oil, but actually having presence there in the Middle East, I mean, through private businesses. I'm not talking about military installations necessarily, but through private businesses, the more we're intertwined, the better. Yes, ma'am, you had your hand up before. Hi, thank you, Rachel Oswald, Congressional Quarterly. Um, so you, certainly around the Wednesday vote, I've heard um, um, some uh, expectation setting that it's not likely to pass the Senate. But at the same time, it comes it comes as the Justice Against uh, Victim the the JASTA bill um, um, has cleared the Congress, and there's a potential veto override happening. So I see that the, the two things linked in that these are two things that Saudi Arabia opposes and that there is bipartisan congressional support around. So even if this um, privilege resolution doesn't succeed, do you senators think that the ground in Congress is changing and that um, future um, privilege resolutions of this like may find more support? Let me follow that up with, with a, a question as well, which is this. You, you rightly said, uh, Senator Paul, that uh, the Russians have been in Syria for decades. And I think when I talk to folks from the region, even if they're totally opposed to Assad, they recognize that the Russians stick with their allies. So based on this question and on what you're trying to do, doesn't that send the signal that unlike the Russians, we don't stick with our allies. That's a, a tough question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, 
going back to the question of uh, most of the easier question, uh, <laughs> the most likely to pass, um, if I based the decisions on what I would support and what I do on what's most likely to pass, there's a lot of things I wouldn't do. And in fact, I wouldn't be very busy up here because I'm trying to do things a little bit differently. But I would say that we're going against a bipartisan consensus and tradition of intervention, that intervention is always good, always works, and we should always intervene. And so any lessening of that intervention, I'm not even talking about no intervention, any lessening of the intervention is met with resistance. And the majority of people are in town and in Congress do believe that intervention is the answer, that arms are always the answer. And really, you know, um, we did a better job, believe it or not. We got a lot of criticism from many on the other side of the aisle under George W. Bush. But the two military excursions that he was involved with, Afghanistan and Iraq, we had votes on. And so um, President Obama ran in 2007, and one of his most famous statements, I quote, and I, I have quoted back to him as well, is that no president should unilaterally go to war without the authority of Congress unless we're under imminent attack. And so one day we were having lunch, not just he and I, but several of the Republican, the Republican caucus, and I asked him those words, and I said, what about, you know, the war in Libya, you know, there was no congressional authority. Do you no longer believe in what you said? And he said, oh, no, no, there was an imminent attack. And I said, really? He said, yeah, of Benghazi. And I said, you've got to be kidding me, that your standard means imminent attack of a foreign city allows for the president to unilaterally initiate war. That is a standard far different than what he presented and far different than when most of us believe a president should be allowed to respond to an imminent attack of the United States. Um, but these things should be debated. We should debate whether Congress should be involved with the initiation of war, whether we win or lose. And yes, you're probably right. We do lose, probably. But I think we bring attention to the issue. There's been no debate in our country, almost zero debate in the newspapers, on television, or from the presidential candidates whether we should be at war in Yemen. None. Or the ramifications of the war in Yemen. Almost zero. There's been no real congressional debate over the, over the war against ISIS or how it should, how it should uh, Ensue. I would say the short answer to your question is, is yes, I think things are changing in Congress when it comes to uh, our perspective on the U.S.-Saudi relationship. I think you are seeing um, more willingness to challenge the nature of the relationship, and I think that's positive. I'm probably the loudest critic of our relationship, but I don't argue that we should throw it out. Um, I, I'm a realist. Um, I'm somebody that b believes there are important parts for alliances, but alliances go both ways. And if your partner is doing things that aren't in your interest, then you need to reserve the ability to start questioning your participation in that alliance. And I think it's beyond charitable to suggest that the Russians engage in value-based alliances. They are the classic realist player. And as soon as a country dis decides to part ways with the Russian national interest, Russia not only parts ways with you, but occasionally invades, right? They were, they were part, the Russians and the Ukrainians were partners, were on the verge of signing a new gas deal. And the minute that the Ukrainian people decided that they didn't like that deal, um, uh, then there were Russian troops inside of Ukraine. So I don't worry that, uh, the, that, the, that Russia is sending a message that we will always be with you come thick or thin. A and I think it's important for us to send the message that we do have values-based allies in this world. Um, they're in Europe. They're in Asia. Um, but today, I, I don't know that we have a values-based partner in Saudi Arabia in the way that we do with many other countries. And we have treaties with other countries that, 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 we, will hold, that we will hold up our end of the bargain. Uh, there are other alliances where I think it needs some rethinking. Paul. Paul Miller, thank you both for your initiative and your, for your very clear explanation today for what you're doing. Regarding congressional authorizations for the use of military force, uh, if there were to be a new AUMF to supplant the existing ones, which, as Senator Paul observed, don't really cover 
much of the military activity we have undertaken in the Middle East. How would each of you like to see such a resolution worded? Uh, what the objective should be, uh, what the scope should be, and how the limits, uh, what the limits should be either geographically or temporally? So uh, I would argue that there should be a temporal limitation in the range of three to five years. I would argue, for, now let's talk about, the, the, let's talk about a, an authorization of military force against ISIS. Um, because we, we could also debate an authorization of military force against the Houthis, um, which I would argue w would be appropriate given the circumstances. So with respect to a military authorization against ISIS, I would argue that it should be time limited in the neighborhood of three to five years. I would argue that it should have a geographic specificity to it. The administration can propose what that geographic, what those geographic parameters sh should be, but given the fact that ISIS now has claimed affiliates in dozens upon dozens of countries, it would be a massive redistribution of war making authority to the executive if we, if we simply said that wherever someone claims to have an affiliation with ISIS, you now have authorization to conduct military activities. And I would argue that it should have a tactical limitation as well. I would argue that there should be a prohibition on the use of ground forces. I think that is such a disaster, that would be such a disastrous mistake uh, in the fight against ISIS that it should be included in the authorization. And I think if we want to be relevant again as a, uh, as a body, um, that it would be appropriate to debate that kind of resolution. Well, Senator Murphy and I are, are close on this issue as well, maybe slightly different on the exact details, but I do believe it should be temporally limited, geographically limited, and tactically limited. Um, I would probably go for a year at a time. And people say, well, gosh, that's why would we come back every year? Congress is so messy, you'd never get them to vote for anything. When we've been attacked, we've been pretty unanimous. I mean, after 9-11, Congress was fairly unanimous, you know, to respond to those who attacked us. After World War II, within 24 hours, we were fairly unanimous. So I really don't worry about, in times when our national interests are clearly affected, us being able to vote for something in Congress. The other times, I think, have been less clear and still are less clear whether it was in our national interest when the votes have been much closer. With regard to geography, there are 32 countries that pledge allegiance to ISIS now. Um, they, my side, voted for a resolution uh, basically with no temporal limits, no geographic limits, and no tactical limits the last time, and I voted against it. The Democrat side had some temporal limits, but I think the last one didn't have geographic limits, and I voted against that one too. Um, it is different than fighting Germany and Japan. Uh, we're not really fighting a, uh, a government that it's going to be clear when victory comes. Because it, let's say, for example, you put 200,000 uh, American troops in against ISIS tomorrow. How long do you think victory would take? Well, certainly we could do it in, what, a day, two days, three days. As we advance forward with our tanks and our planes, they would disappear. But would we have won? And, you know, who's going to go on the aircraft carrier and sign the armistice, you know? I just don't think they're the, that peace, I think they disappear. It's been my opinion that, one, you're fighting a radical ideology, so it's difficult to defeat in conventional terms. But, two, I think that um, I'm of the belief that, and some people don't like the way I characterize this, but that civilized Islam will have to defeat radical Islam or, or aberrant Islam or people who I think are truly rejecting the real teachings of Islam, because I don't think they'll ever accept it from us. Um, because many, even those who aren't radicalized, who live there, see us as as pagans or foreigners or satanic or whatever they don't they don't they won't accept victory from us and so the victory and the boots on the ground need to be islamic boots on the ground and i think uh, there are plenty of those who live in the area who aren't excited and don't think isis represents islam and they can be stamped out and i also like uh, going back to the article thomas friedman wrote about a year ago that he talked about containment and amplification um, we contain the menace, and while we're containing the menace, we amplify our friends over there. And that is something I would support arms. But, uh, and it depends on how you give the arms and who you give them to. I frankly think over time we should have been giving many more directly to the Kurds than through the Iraqi government. Um, but I'd probably still, you know, help the Iraqi government as well. But I think the Kurds have shown themselves to be the best fighters in the region and the most successful, and they'd probably do better with more arms. In fact, the hundred billion dollars in arms we've given to the Saudi Arabia would have probably been better spent going to the Kurds than Saudi Arabia. Um, I think also that um, you know some of the weapons we've given to Saudi Arabia and some of our weapons, frankly, we kind of 
had a big boat full of weapons and we were passing them out saying, do you like America? Raise your hand. I love America. Can I have that shoulder to air missile that I'll fire? We have no idea who the moderates are. We have no idea who the people are that are taking the weapons off these ships. And many of the weapons from Saudi Arabia, I think, did wind up in the hands of either al-Nusra directly or ISIS. Um, so I think we do have to, if we look at an AUMF, significantly limited with time, geography, and I think the boots on the ground need to be people who live there. Uh, Dimitri Symes is president of the center. Can I go away? Thank you very much. I also have a question about Syria. Uh, you know, I'm sure about yesterday, accidental attack on Syrian soldiers, more than 60 were killed, uh, many were wounded. There were new developments today, uh, early in the morning in Moscow, uh, the general staff has announced that under the circumstances they could not ask the Syrians anymore to comply with the ceasefire. Then President Putin made a statement that this was a horrible crime and he had serious questions about U.S. intentions. Then now President Assad made an announcement that he is no longer complying with the ceasefire. Then uh, there was an announcement by both sides that there is a new rebel, primarily al-Nusra offensive in Aleppo. Now there is a new information from Moscow that the Russians would help the Syrians, uh, would use the air force to deal with this offensive. Now, some of these, of course, are just announcements and rhetoric. But we are dealing with some very serious escalation, at least potentially. What do you think we should do? Try harder with Putin. He is a realist, even if he is a vicious realist. Uh, should we be prepared to use force against the Syrian army? Should we uh, tell Putin that his air force, that they will not have a free ride in Syria? What are options? What would you recommend? That's an easy question. I'm going to leave that to Senator Martin. <laughs> 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 well, uh, th that that question has under uh, underlaid beneath it the assumption that is ever present and evergreen in this city that the United States th that the United States can solve this, right? And if you start with the assumption that the United States can solve this, then you are never going to come up with the right answer. A and I think that that is one of my. And I'm not going to give you the answer that you want here um, because there isn't an answer that begins and ends with the United States. But if you start with the premise that the United States can solve it, then you may end up getting to an answer that makes it worse, not better, because your underlying assumption is fundamentally flawed. And so the, the, the Hippocratic Oath, you know, needs to apply to foreign policy as well. First, do no harm. And as Senator Paul said, I'm in complete agreement with him. We have been so frenzied to provide arms to anyone that we think is ultimately going to fight the batter guys inside, that we have now ended up in situations in which U.S. arms are being used against each other. And believe me, 10 and 20 and 30 years from now, um, we will see more and more instances in which U.S. arms that we threw in on both sides of the conflict get, get used against each other. Now, when you watch those videos and you see those pictures, that is a totally and completely unsatisfactory answer, that the United States cannot solve this. But how terrible must it, be, must it feel to people inside Syria that the United States isn't at the very least helping to empty out that country of everyone that wants to flee? At the very least, we should be reconsidering our commitment to take a piddling amount of 10,000 Syrians. We should be putting in every dime necessary to help make sure that every refugee, wherever they are in that region, gets fed. I don't think we can solve this alone. I think we should stop trying to find U.S.-led, U.S.-dominated solutions for this crisis. There will be a solution, ultimately. We will participate in it, but it likely won't be led by the United States. And what is most damning is the fact that we are not doing what is necessary to try to provide humanitarian relief, to try to bring refugees to this country, um, and instead trying to come up with an answer to a question that is probably fundamentally flawed. Well, you certainly did answer the question. <laughs> uh, gentleman in the blue shirt. Well, wait until you get a mic and then tell us who you are. Chris Smith, Middle East Forum. Um, this is mostly for Senator Paul, but both of you might answer. You both repeatedly talked about um, 
Saudis funding um, Wahhabism and extremist ideology, and Senator Paul, you specifically mentioned them doing so even in this country. Um, I wondered um, if you would favor anything clamping down on their ability to fund that, especially in America. I know um, Congressman Bratt actually has a bill that's I believe it's called the Religious Freedom Reciprocity Act that would bar funding in um, like religious activities in the U.S. if that country didn't allow for religious freedom in their country. It's mean, mostly aimed at Saudi money. You know, I think these are really sensitive issues when we talk about any kind of restrictions on, um, you know, religious foundations or churches or mosques or anything, even if the money's coming in from foreign sources. Um, and I'm a huge believer not only in religious liberty, but freedom of speech as well, um, believing that it should almost never be limited. However, I think some limitations can occur when you're advocating violence. You're advocating violent overthrow of the government. So, uh, yes, um, we give, we also, uh, you could approach it in a slightly different way as far as banning it. You could also take away any kind of tax exemptions to any foundation that is uh, advocating for violence. But then you'd have to prove your case. And so um, I think that, uh, yes, we should think about things like that. I'm not saying that I advocate a specific bill or doing it, but uh, for me it would be the advocation of uh, violence. And, you know, Britain has begun doing some of this, and uh, it is insulting to taxpayers when you find someone who actually lives in your country and is actually using the system or living off the system that comes from the wealth of our country and then attacking, you know, and calling for the violent overthrow of the country. So um, now I think it's a, a difficult question. And I think it ought, it ought to be uh, thought through before you come to a conclusion on it. Okay, the uh, gentleman next to the gentleman in the blue shirt, you had your hand up too, unless. You... Okay, um, anyone else? Yes, sir, back there. Uh, hello, my name is Mike Helms with Oxfam America. Uh, I wanted to cycle back to um, a point that you made, Senator Paul, in your opening remarks, and then uh, Senator Murphy in response to a question namely the fact that the United States is an active participant in this war. And my question is uh, about the obligations the United States has when faced with credible um, allegations of violations of international humanitarian law uh, that we need to stop um, arms sales until there are credible investigations of those allegations. Do you think that either of those two boxes have been checked? And if not, when that switch might flip? Well, I think you make a good point. It's a point that needs to be emphasized. This isn't just about selling arms to Saudi Arabia. We are refueling their planes in the air that are dropping the bombs. To me, and I'm not a military person, but that sounds like you're in, intimately involved in the war. We're selecting the targets and refueling the planes. So this isn't just about selling them tanks and saying, you know, please don't invade your neighboring country. But it's also one more point I want to make about the Arms Export Control Act of 1976 that allows us to have this disapproval resolution. It says in that resolution that arms that we sell to our friends, and presumably we're only selling arms to our friends, but when we sell arms to our friends, it says that they need to be solely for internal use and legitimate self-defense which I think really the war in Yemen is a violation. That, that's not for internal use or self-defense. And uh, so I think that debate needs to happen, but it's nobody's having the debate. That's what I think is so important about this, is that we are going to have a debate uh, this week on it, and hopefully people will begin to discuss whether it's a good or a bad idea. I, listen, our, our goal should be to stay out of wars and keep our friends out of wars. But to the extent that war is inevitable in modern times, and there are also right ways to fight wars and wrong ways to fight wars. Um, I believe I heard today that the American Bar Association issued a resolution in, I think, either tacit or implicit support of uh, the legislation we're discussing today. Why is that? It's because international lawyers and international human rights lawyers that are a member of the bar believe that we have an obligation as a country to suspend arms sales when we have knowledge that international human rights agreements are being violated. And they are inside Saudi Arabia today. One right way to fight a war is to work with aid organizations to make sure that your targeting is correct. I've heard multiple reports from aid organizations sitting in my office telling me that they are not in contact with the coalition to provide that assistance and targeting in the way that they have been in other conflicts throughout the world. Uh, and so there, there, is, there is clearly 
uh, there, there's clearly a, a, a right way to fight an engagement and a wrong way to fight an engagement. And right now, there is a U.S. imprint on these deaths in part because some simple things aren't being done inside Yemen to try to reduce civilian casualties. We have time for one more question. Okay, Oda, please. You got to you got to identify yourself first. When you look at uh, Identify yourself. Yeah, Oda Aberdeen, the Capital Trust Group. When you look at the U.S.-Saudi economic relationship, every major multinational firm has a lot of business in Saudi Arabia. The, the car industry, IBM, the airline industry. Those relationships, in my view, in my, in my estimate, create two million jobs every morning. Two million Americans go to work because of the relationship with Saudi Arabia and some other GCC countries. But when it comes to military sales, the U.S. military arms industry also promotes that. It's not just Obama, and it's not just Bush. So there is an economic business factor, and that is U.S. jobs. In the state of Connecticut, United Technology, sells millions of dollars worth of weapons and even in your state where the Phillips, Conoco Phillips is involved. So there's, a, there's an impact. On the one hand, yes, we have our values and we should stand by our values. And on the other hand, you have jobs. And if you look at the campaign, Trump and Hillary, all they talk about jobs, jobs, jobs. How do you reconcile the two? Easily. I have tens of thousands of defense jobs in the state of Connecticut. Electric Boat, Pratt & Whitney, Sikorsky, Hamilton, Sunstrand. I will never make a decision that compromises U.S. national security in order to grow defense jobs in my state. And I think that's the question that we're asking ourselves here. If AQAP gains a foothold inside Yemen such that they can constitute enough strength to attack the United States. The day after uh, another few thousand Americans are killed, there is going to be no one who wants to hear that we participated in this war because it created some additional jobs in the United States, despite the fact that we knew that it was accruing to the detriment of U.S. national security interests. So I don't deny that the defense industry is a major player when it comes to jobs in my state. I don't deny that the economic relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia is strong and important. But our first job um, is to protect this country from attack. And I believe that we are putting this country in jeopardy of attack. Again, if we don't get serious about bringing a settlement to the war inside Yemen, uh, that is my first obligation as a senator. I think Senator Murphy put it very well. You know, our job is to vote for what is best to defend the country, but uh, defense contractor jobs are not uh, something that would come before individuals. When I think about how I'm going to vote on any um, discussion or any decision with regard to war, I think of the young man in a neighboring town who lost both legs and an arm. That's who I'm voting for, is uh, what is in the national interest of our country. And, uh, you know, do we want a strong defense industry? Sure we do. I'm all for it, uh, for legitimate concerns. And I want to have the strongest national defense in, in the world. And we do. And we should continue to do it. But we should never see it as a jobs program and that we vote on it based on the jobs versus, uh, you know, the consideration of the individual you're going to send to war. Well, I, I have three takeaways from this discussion, and I hope you share them with me. The first is you've seen a wonderful example of principled bipartisanship. Uh, it really makes me feel good as an American. Secondly, we've seen a very good case for why Congress should retain a role in foreign policy. Again, as you said, Senator, the Constitution says so. James Madison said so. Uh, but it's good to know that a few hundred years later, it's still important. And finally, whether you agree or not with the legislation we've talked about, you've certainly heard a powerful case for it. And that's important, too. So I want to thank both the senators and thank you all for really an excellent discussion today. Thank you. Thank you.